Bruno Rivera, Elinit Gramish, Javier Montes, and David Lope. I would like to introduce the moderator, Mr. Do uh, David Lope del Amo. He is the director of Cynicus, a literary consultancy based in Beijing, which focuses on introducing foreign rights content into the U East Asian markets. He is also the coordinator of Cynicus Platform, a writer's panel series where Asian and European authors play host to each other. David collaborates with several national book institutes and is currently advising both the Spanish and Polish institutes on how to increase their author's presence in China. May I welcome the panelists and the moderator? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this session on new European writing, uh, it's uh, co-sponsored by, by LAF, Literature Across Frontiers. This is a, a European organization based in Wales that uh, promotes literary exchanges between Asia and Europe. Without further ado, I'm just going to introduce the, uh, the three writers. Uh, Bruno hails from Portugal. Um, his first book, As Primeiras Coisas, The Former Things, uh, was the winner of uh, four uh, major awards in Portugal that was a uh, tremendous success. Um, so he was the winner of the Penn Award. He was also the winner of the Saramago Award and two other major awards. Um, at the moment he's uh, writing another novel and perhaps if you're curious he might uh, collaborate and tell you a little bit about that in the, in the, in the question section. Uh, to, at the center we have uh, Javier Montes He's a Spanish writer from Madrid. Um, he, uh, well, he's also a translator, a literary critic. I forgot to mention that Bruno, all of the panelists here are, are translators as well, and, and you can feel that in, in their writing, in the sense that it's, it's quite an open writing, open in terms of thematic influences, aesthetic influences. Uh, as I said, Javier uh, was uh, entered the, the literary stage uh, with the novel Los Penultimos, the, 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 the Penultimates, uh, which won uh, the, the Jose Maria Pereda Award, was it? And uh, later on, he published uh, The Hotel Life, which is available in English. And uh, the novel that uh, we'll, uh, we will talk about here is his, I mean, not the novel, the, the, the book, which is a sort of memoir, essay, and, and has some bits of, of, uh, of uh, auto fiction. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's called Varados en Rio in Spanish, uh, Stranded in Rio. And then uh, to my side, uh, we have uh, Elinette Gramic. Uh, she has mixed blood. She comes from Wales, but she also has some German roots. And um, the, 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 short, uh, the short form, the, the, the short fiction work, that she will be speaking today uh, received two different names. So uh, you presented it to an award, uh, and it was called. Uh, how did you call it? That? Themes from a Hokkaido life, and then they changed it to a better title, which is "Woman Who Brings the Rain." Right. Well, not sure if it's a better title, but uh, certainly more commercial, more appealing. Yes. All right. So um, there's no way to summarize the. The writing that emerges from Europe nowadays, it's, it's a continent, uh, it, has, it hails from different literary traditions, um, so the only way we could perhaps find some uh, commonalities in the writing of the authors that we are presenting here is that preoccupation for writing about the place. Um, the works that they will be talking about are works in which a sense of place is very important. In some respects, uh, place as this location, in the, in the case of Elinet and in the case of Javier, they are writing about places of adoption, places where they've been spending some time, and places that allow them to negotiate their identity uh, with regards to you know, a, a surrounding that is not familiar, that on a surface level it seems uh, hospitable, but uh, later on, uh, can become stifling or can become, you know, uh, a source of, 
questioning about you know their own identity and their own roots and, and their own places of origin. And then uh, Bruno Vieira, uh, his uh, his novel, uh, the former the former things, is also very grounded in in the play, in, in in this concept of place, describing um, a neighborhood of the south of Lisbon that is not normally uh, featuring in in the in the travel brochures, uh, a neighborhood that is more uh, plural, that uh, it's a mix of of people from different. Uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, from different sort of um, life experiences, working class, and, uh, and a neighborhood that uh, he decides to capture in order to bring dignity to the personal stories of, of the people living there. So I will just want to uh, direct uh, a question to, to all of the writers so that they can address it uh, one by one concerning this, this issue of uh, you know, we, we, dis we, we, we said it was a coincidence that they were writing about plays, but why is play so important in, in, in these works? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for you all being here. Um, well, for me, uh, from the, the first moment I I decided to, to write about this neighborhood, the neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, I knew I had to tell the, the stories of, this, of these people. Uh, sometimes writers, they, even in Portugal nowadays, they have to travel far away to find a, an exotic place to write about. But I didn't have to travel that far because that exotic place, even for most of Portuguese readers of the book, that place was the place where I grew up in. Uh, after the, the book was published in Portugal, there was a journalist, Portuguese journalist, based in Lisbon, that went there to interview me. Uh, and she, she had been in Mozambique for a while. And she said, well, this looks like Africa. So. That exotic place, not for me, but for the reader, was there. And uh, because something exotic is something that is out of sight. But once you live there, or if you uh, live there for all your life, it's not that exotic. Um, it's the same thing, uh, all places, if you are not there, seem strange to you, in a way. I just arrived here at uh, Hyderabad two days ago. And uh, I felt I was in another planet. Uh, but uh, once I got here in the festival, uh, hearing people talking and, and uh, sharing uh, the, the experiences about the literary world and so on, uh, I felt at home. So places may seem strange, but uh, we have a common uh, humanity. Um, and uh, I think that that common humanity is uh, is uh, experienced uh, through other people's stories. Once you 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 stop and hear people talking about their lives, they don't seem strange anymore. They don't seem exotic anymore uh, because you find something in common. Uh, I wanted to share that uh, with my with my my readers through my book to other people's stories because it's it's also the the story uh, of a man that has to go back living uh, to his mother's place. Uh, he, he, had, uh, he has lost his job he, and he, he just broke up with his wife. So he's forced to go back there. Uh, he had a, a difficult relation uh, with, the, with that place and those people. And it's a story about coming to terms uh, with who you are through other people's <laughs> stories and uh, it's a story of coming to terms uh, with yourself by trying to reach out for, for other people's stories um, that's what I try to do and of course it has a lot to do with that, with, with that particular place uh, with that particular setting because I don't think that uh, people are uh, determined by the place where they are born but of course they are influenced by it 
they are conditioned by by the place they are born by uh, the the class they, they are born the race the religion but they are not determined by that that's not uh, all they are so I, I try to to through the, the, those people's very very different stories the, the, those very different stories of, of people living there I, I tried to uh, to make that uh, uh, clear that, uh, once you get to your people all the strangeness uh, so to speak disappears thanks everybody for having us here and, and thanks to the festival for inviting us um, yeah places can be characters right uh, I mean, you, you can uh, we were having this very interesting conversation yesterday uh, by dinner time and trying to decide whether there was anything such an European ethos or an a European way of, of, of being in the world. Maybe we all here in a loose way because the lunette is obviously younger and, and far more beautiful and everything, but maybe the, the, um, the common ground would be that this generation of European writers was able to travel. I mean, traveling became less expensive to begin with, easier. There were those very famous Erasmus scholarships, which meant that I mean, they were for rich kids, I think, you know, because they, they, there was not so money involved, in, so much money involved in it. But it opened up the possibility of European uh, young students traveling abroad and getting to meet uh, people from other European countries and so on. So I think that could be a, a very loose common ground. You know? the, 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 the fact that almost every every European writer I know has either lived in another European country, either married or, or been in love with some other European guy or girl. Uh, I don't know. There's a sense of a common ground. It might not uh, be as solid as we thought it was and things, but this is still there. There's this, this feeling of, of a common uh, ecosystem, so to speak. No? This said, in my particular case, um, um, I I wanted to write about um, places, I mean, taking one particular place, which in my case was Rio de Janeiro, where I happened to be living for a couple of years, and using this particular place as a symbol of other things. No? I mean, Rio is an interesting city in its own. It's uh, a metaphor as well. It's for some reason or other, even if it's not as, as uh, beautiful and as an idyllic as people think it is, but then you get there and you see obvious political, uh, um, uh, social, urban uh, problems in it, and lots of inequality and, and many other big problems, but it is still a place that evokes an idea of, 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 um, of uh, paradise on earth. No? I mean, it would be long to, uh, to this rank of places which are at the same time physical and real, and, and they're in the map, and you can actually travel and, and get there, and at the same time they are imaginary they belong to, to this uh, map in which other, you know, legendary places as, as Xanadu or, or El Dorado or, you know, legendary places that are more uh, part of our imaginations than, than, than real in themselves. I ended up living there for, for as I said, a couple of years and uh, I was interesting, I, I thought it was interesting to, to see what happens when you end up stranded or, or exiled in a place that is supposed to be paradise. No? We are used to think of, of uh, exile as a, as a curse and as, a, as something you endure because you have no alternative, but uh, you are exiled in places you want to flee and you want to leave. No? What happens when you end up ex in exile in a place that is uh, desired and, and uh, dreamed of by mankind in general? No, I mean, re I, don't, I know of very few people who would say no to a trip to Rio de Janeiro or who, would, who, would, who wouldn't have an image of, of Rio de Janeiro as a, as a paradise on earth. So instead of, of um, uh, talking about my own experience there, which was maybe not that interesting, or at least it wasn't interesting to me, I didn't want to write a memoir, um, I thought it would be more interesting if I kind of research what other writers previously foreign writers had felt and had written when in exile in, in this particular place. It is a book about my own experience in a way by proxy and by, by uh, using uh, those writers as fiction characters as well, trying to, not to, to in, uh, I mean, trying to be faithful to what it 
hap really happen, but still using them as characters, using Rio also as a metaphor and as a, as a, as a character on its own. And in the end, it's not either about my experience of Rio, it's not either about their experience of Rio, it, it would be more about a common shared experience I think we all feel sooner or later, which is uh, the experience of being in exile, not the experience of, of, of what the Portuguese call saudade, the nostalgia for something that it might never really have been that real in the end, nostalgia for what you left behind, the feeling of, of being a total unknown in a total unknown place, the, the feeling of, of having to rebuild your whole relationship to, to, to your surroundings and to the people that surround you. And I think that's the ideal situation, and not so ideal personally, but maybe professionally, for a writer, no? the, the, to kind of cut the, the routine connections to, to what surrounds you and try to rebuild from zero and to, to kind of uh, see things as if they were new uh, to you and, and conveying that idea to your readers. No? So, that would be a so we've spoken of coming to terms, we've spoken of nostalgia and uh, we can speak now about this location, right, Anine? Uh, yeah, well I was about to say as well, we talked a lot about um, commonality in feeling part of maybe part of a European um, community, um, and definitely that's that is there is an element of that. But from my personal experiences, um, this has been much more about dislocation and about kind of um, sort of divisiveness. And I think the reason for that is is because you know I was I was born in Britain, I'm from, from Wales, which is a small uh, country within the United Kingdom. Um, and and then my father is German, so as you said, I'm mixed blood. I'm both German and Welsh equally. I can't really pick one or the other. And then I grew up in England. Um, and probably for those of you who don't know, being Welsh German in England is is like the, I picked the two most unpopular countries to be from. So English people don't really like Germany because of the history, obviously, and they don't really like Wales either. They think it's a you know backwater or whatever. Have a lot of terrible stereotypes and about about Wales, not all of them obviously, but just sort of a general sweep. So starting to write, um, I would write, I've written short stories about Wales and about Germany. And for me it was really difficult to know what, what sh which place shall I write about, Wales or Germany, because I'm half and half. And for me place is everything in a story as well. I mean, it's where everything is rooted, where everything comes from, where the characters develop. I mean, it's, it's, it's so integral to the story for me personally. So it was very difficult for me to choose Wales and Ger or Germany. And I felt a lot of, as you said, like division within me. So what I did, what happily sort of occurred, is that I went to Japan and I lived there for two years. And then suddenly I was almost relieved I could write about somewhere else. I could write about Japan. And Japan um, was kind of re a revelation to me. Um, and I lived not I lived in Tokyo, but I also spent a lot of time in Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island in Japan, and it's very very different from the kind of uh, maybe the stereotypes of Japan or the Japan that we see maybe every day on the television on the papers. So it's very rural. Uh, firstly, it uh, doesn't have um, you know all the skyscrapers and bright lights or anything like that. It's a very quiet um, place, and. Um, and as I write in the book, it reminded me of Wales. The countryside reminded me of Wales. It's very, it's very wet, you know, very green. And the more north you go, the more it reminds me maybe of, of Russia. You know, the Siberia is just around the corner. Um, and it's a very, very rugged landscape. And there are bears, you know, wandering around. Um, anyway, so I, I really loved it there. And for me, um, yeah, as I said, the, the sense of dislocation that I was in Japan and I was seeing these elements of, of Wales uh, in a place that was completely different to, to where I came from and constantly having to kind of, um, I don't know, bring these two aspects together or make sense of them. And in the end, the way to do that for me was to, to write about it and to explore um, my sort of reactions to, to Japan in, in words. Um, I, I guess there is some, some hope uh, in Europe, when we are facing these very complicated political, political times in which uh, the politicians are very inward looking and you know building walls and, and uh, sort of uh, putting people in pigeonholes, 
And then the writers that we see here are, you know, indicating through their writing just the very opposite. The going to other places or the, uh, the representing of, of uh, a plurality within, within Europe that is certainly not uh, that present in the, in, the, in the mass media. So um, we don't want to theorize too much, but uh, I, I suppose, you know, the, 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 you have a particular attitude to, to um, you know, to what's going on in Europe and, and uh, in some respect that uh, permeates in your writing, isn't it? Uh, I think we as writers, we, well, we have a great advantage uh, uh, towards the politi politicians and uh, uh, priests because we are not trying to convince anyone. You know, we, well, also for me, uh, I'm just trying to, to convey uh, my worldview, the, the, the world as I, I see it. I'm not interested in convincing any, anyone of my ideas or uh, making them vote for me or whatever. I just want to say, well, this is a, a, a slice of life. Uh, that probably for most of you is completely alien but here it is a slice of life that I, I think that um, I, had, I have the, the, the moral obligation to convey a, in a book um, because otherwise I feel it would be lost so that's why we as writers are, maybe uh, you feel you can have that feel of more uh, being more free uh, in, a, in, a, in times of uh, political, uh, you know, turbulence. Well, turbulence in a way. Uh, but uh, really, we we are not trying to uh, to sell our ideas. Well, we are trying to sell our books. Uh, that's that's true. But we are not trying to impose our worldview. We are trying to share uh, that that worldview. So when I look to what's going on in, uh, in Europe, um, I really do feel that, uh, le last night we were talking about that, there are two ways right now of seeing, of seeing things and uh, looking at uh, the political panorama in, in Europe. One is to, go in, uh, is to go after the what politicians say, some politicians say, is to build walls and to be on your own, don't care about the others. Uh, and the other one is to share. Share, to, to go to other places, uh, to invite people to your own. Um, and, I, and I think that, uh, it's, it's not the majority of, of people in Europe. Javier was telling me that yesterday and I agree with him. So the majority of people that are, are going after the, this, this kind of, of speech and this kind of ideas, political ideas. Uh, but anyway, there are, there are lots of people uh, following that because uh, it's reassuring for them, you know. When you have a scapegoat to blame for all your misdeeds and uh, shortcomings, then you, you, feel, you feel good about it because you feel it's not your fault. So politician, politicians just uh, uh, use that uh, to get power. And uh, writers are not in that, uh, as we say in Portugal, we are not that on, on that championship. It's not our league, really. We are, uh, of course, we are affected by it. Some, some of us reflect uh, about the, those problems in, uh, in our books. Uh, but we are not on the same league. As I, I heard yesterday also, uh, literature doesn't impose a truth. Uh, literature is offering uh, diversity to people. So you can pick and choose and uh, uh, follow your own way. Uh, see how the world works, how other people see the world. That's what, uh, what literature and writers uh, do. So, of course, we are here talking about uh, Europe, Europe and European literature. 
And I, I know we are not representative of all Europe. We are representative of us, of, and maybe uh, uh, of writers. Um, of course, there are problems, social, political, economical problems going on. Uh, we are affected by it, and we want to convey it uh, in, in our books also. Uh, but not as the, we don't address those problems the same way politicians do. And Javier, certainly um, two of, your, uh, of, the, of the people you speak, the authors you speak about in your book, uh, came from Europe in, in also difficult times uh, to Rio, mm. and, and, and two others, one Elizabeth Bishop was from, I mean, from Canada, and uh, Manuel Puig from, from Argentina, but they also were exiling themselves from, you know, interior exiles or social exiles rather than political. Um, going back to what Bruno said, I do agree. You know, I think reading is is, is I mean, you can you can choose to read in both ways. You can choose to read what confirms your beliefs and what reassures you. And you, these days, with with the Twitter and, and feeds and things, you you can actually just read. Uh, things that are exactly what you already thought. You, know? so you subscribe to the right, I mean, you have that choice. No, you have the choice of subscribing to the right guys, to follow the right uh, people, the right for you. I mean, the right things, and you will live in a totally sealed sphere of thought in which everybody thinks exactly what you want them to think. So, reading and writing is is not per se or in itself a uh, um, more. Uh, it, it doesn't make you become any better. I mean, you choose not to. But on the other side, I think we all here in this table uh, agree that the kind of reader we are interested in, uh, or at least I'll speak for me again, but, uh, the kind of reader I'm looking for, or the kind of reader I hope is looking for me, is the kind of reader who, who goes into a book precisely to, to see other points of view, to see places that he, would, he or she wouldn't see normally, to get into different spheres of thought, to hear different voices, and this is a political experience as well. No, reading in that way is political as well. It's refusing to be fed the, the usual stuff, it's refusing to, to uh, have the usual ideas hammered into your brain again, and that's a personal choice. That's the original scene or the original choice, let's say. No, whether you want to go into the world uh, freely and without fear, or whether you want to, to make the world narrower and just um, feel safe. No? Um, so I would, I would draw the line there. No? Uh, reading and writing can be um, uh, politically uh, oriented in both ways. No? And I do think that there's still lots of people uh, inside of Europe and in the whole world, of course, that who are still interested in seeing things from different perspectives who do not really want to buy whatever uh, brilliant ideas any populist politician or nationalist uh, uh, so-called leader tells them and as long as there are people like that and potential readers like that uh, I, I as a writer will be writing for them no? reading is an act of empathy isn't it Re reading makes you feel for other people even if they're completely different to you you're, you're entering their heads you're seeing things from their perspective um, so it's, it's that's why it's so powerful. But I mean, I feel a bit, you, you both come from Portugal and Spain and I come from Britain who have decided to, to leave Europe. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what's happening now. And um, I mean, just if we're talking about so politics and literature, then just a couple of days ago, um, when the Supreme Court uh, decided that, um, you know, Britain has to has the right now. The MPs have the right to vote whether we leave or not. And but the devolved government, so that means Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, have no say at all about Brexit. They have no say. So that's been decided by the highest court in in Britain. And I think that says a lot about um, yeah uh, in English and England's relationship to Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. But they're not really taken seriously or, or kind of respected. <laughs> Uh, in, in the United Kingdom. And I wanted to say, which I forgot to say last time, was um, as I come from Wales and I, I also write in the Welsh language, 
And when I went to Japan, one of the other things that struck me as very um, sort of very surprising to me, very powerful, was that the, uh, in Japan and in Hokkaido especially, there is also an indigenous language called uh, Ainu, um, which has been sort of oppressed and almost uh, kind of is almost sort of sort of dying at the moment, but it's, it's still it's still there, still hanging on. And when I went to Hokkaido and I discovered this language, I felt immediately more at home. I sort of thought, well, this is this is something I kind of I, I really understand this relationship between mainland Japan, Honshu, and Hokkaido, as in Japanese and, and Ainu, is very similar to you know Great Britain, England, and, and Wales, England, and Scotland. And that was also really a starting point where I thought about rewriting really about this because the majority of people I, I knew didn't, has ne have never heard of Ainu language in the same way that when I was living in England, not many people had really heard of, of Welsh. So that was, that was also a starting point for me personally. Um, let's go into the characters. Let's go, let's go deeper into the characters. Um, you know, in your novel, you depict a whole range of, of uh, different people, different ages, different uh, professions in, you know, that are taking place in, in the neighborhood. I don't know if you would like to perhaps rescue one of them and, and tell us, I don't know, Virgilio maybe, or, or Delphine, or one of those characters that, you know, sort of go through the novel with you and accompany the, the narrator, your alter ego. Okay. Um, there, there was one, actually it was the, the the first, the, the book is divided in chapters. Uh, in, we, we, each chapter tells the, the story of a character or, or an event. Uh, and uh, the first character that I, that I wrote, um, it's 10 or 15 lines. Uh, it's a very brief chapter. It's uh, about uh, uh, this guy named uh, Zeka. Uh, that is actually inspired in someone real, someone that still lives there. Uh, and uh, the one thing that made me want to, to write about him uh, was that w one day I was with a friend of mine in the neighborhood at a local cafe and you, you, we, we saw, saw this guy, Zach, crossing the street and he's nearly 60 years old right now. Uh, he always lived in his uh, parents' home. He never married. Uh, I, I don't know what his profession is. I don't know what he does for a living. Uh, we just, for all my life, I just, I just saw him there uh, on the streets, going home, going out, back home. Uh, and, and my friend uh, asked me, "Oh, do you think that Zac ever been to a, to a movie?" Uh, well, and I said, "Well, I don't think so." I, I couldn't imagine uh, that that guy. Uh, or going to, to a movie uh, outside that, 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 that place, uh, outside that neighborhood. So, for me, that, that was the quintessential question of, of the novel. How, you, how, how is it to, to lead a life like this? Uh, how is it to be stuck in a place for all your life? Uh, how is it to, to not have any kids, no living here in your parents' home. How, how does it feel like to be to live like that? Uh, and uh, I just put that question to the to all of the other other characters. But it started with, with that one. Uh, and one day, just to, to, to finish, uh, there was this guy that uh, I was going to paint my 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 house. Uh, and my house is near the. It's, uh, couple of miles away from the, that neighborhood and he went there uh, I, I drove him to, to my place and he said oh I, be, I haven't been here for I don't know 15 years and it was a couple of miles away so I wanted to write about the, those experiences of life uh, so Zeka uh, is one may, maybe the, the, the symbolic uh, more even uh, more than uh, Virgilio and other characters in the book I think, for me as an author, it was the most symbolic character of, of that novel. Right, and Javier, uh, some of the real authors in your novel uh, put a dramatic end to, you know, being stuck. They take a, a particularly dramatic decision to that. Um, 
Would you like just to choose one of them? Would you like to tell us whether through your research of these, the life of these authors in Rio, you sort of came across some interesting fact that you were not aware of previously, or that is not sort of common, uh, commonplace? Well, the general idea, as I said, was that it feels so weird when you're ex in exile in, um, in a wonderful place. And it's, it's much easier to be in exile in a horrible place. Um, exile works weirdly for writers. No? It, it either makes them write about what they left behind, which is very interesting coincidence about many writers who go abroad or who live abroad, is that it's only then that they get to see what they left behind. No? It's only when, I don't know, think of, think of Nightfall, for example, no? living so far away in Trinidad and then writing about what he had left behind. And sometimes it takes distance and, 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 and nostalgia and saudade to, to, to realize what you left behind. And, and there are others who do the exact opposite. They just forget what they left behind. Think of Nabokov, for example. Ah, I think Nabokov wrote about Russia and things, but, but they even adopt the language of the place that they're, that they've gone to. No? It probably depends on, on your mood, on your on, on, on the type of person you are, and so on. In my book, there's for writers, as you said, the most tragic one and the most well known for 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 you maybe is Stefan Zweig. The, the, Austrian Jewish uh, writer who fled uh, Austria a bit before the Nazis invaded it. He had been a best-selling author, but by the millions. Like think of Paulo Coelho and, and I don't know, and, and a huge, huge bestseller at the time, and a, and a so-called quality one. Uh, and he was rich. I mean, he had family money as well, so he was very fortunate in that, in that way, no? And yet, when he got to Rio, he had been in exile for a long while. He had been to uh, England, the United States. He had been touring the world almost. And the, the, the homeland he was missing was not only far away geographically. I mean, the, the Europe he, he, he left behind, the Europe of uh, in between wars, the Europe of the 20s, was a homeland that he could never, ever return to. Because it was not a matter of kilometers, it was not a matter of the war uh, being over. It was a matter of, of, of <coughs> pure destruction. No? The, the state of mind, the frame of mind, the cultural context in which he was born, one in which a European writer from Berlin would travel to Paris and then meet uh, a Jewish writer who would be writing in German, in Romania. That kind of what George Steiner, this critic, literary critic, called the Europe of the cafes. You know? Let's not be nostalgic about that, but he was nostalgic about that, and he felt that was lost forever, and it was lost forever. So um, after a while, he had lost his language, he had lost his mental landscape, and he chose to commit suicide. No, so he was in Rio, uh, Brazil was blooming, it was about to enter one of the most fascinating uh, decades in the whole uh, cultural world of, of the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was a very modern country. It had plenty of things to offer. But there is this very interesting um, anecdote, and I'll finish with that. When he got to Rio de Janeiro, and the, um, the girl, a very beautiful girl, he says, who stamps his visa, writes under the, the signature, uh, her color, she writes gray. And he protests. He says, oh, but my, my hair is still brown. And the girl says, well, okay, brown. But he realizes, and she realizes, and everybody around realizes that, that he's too old to, to, to re, re, reinvent himself in this new country. So after a, a year or so there, he committed suicide. It's probably the moment in which he realizes that, that he's too old for, for a whole new, brave new world as Brazil was. And Elinette, any closing remarks with regard to your story? Um, yeah, uh, I don't know how to follow that up from Stefan Zweig. <laughs> oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, well, like, my, yeah, so I wrote a, a short memoir about Hokkaido, and um, I suppose that I don't have, it's, as I said, a me it's actually a memoir, it's, it's based on, on truth, so I don't really have any, any characters, or I suppose Stefan Zweig's story is based on, on truth as fact as well. But um, for me, personally, it was, I was learning Japanese at the time, so when I was trying to write about the family I was staying with, there was two 
retire, uh, ret a retired couple, the Tatinos, and their dog, Hannah. And, um, you know, they live in this huge house in Hokkaido, and they sort of like to have foreign, you know, foreign students come and stay with them. And as I was, I was learning Japanese, I, I was I sort of trying to talk with them and try to understand them, but it's always in this haze of half knowing a language. You know, so I was trying to describe, trying to get to know them through what they did, the details of what they did. Um, so, for instance, uh, the Tatino San, the, the, the man, he, um, he was retired, but he constantly had to work, couldn't stop working, so he was always flitting about. And the, the wife would stay at home taking his phone calls. And I realized actually when they were working, they worked in the same office, and she was his, basically at the call center taking the calls, and he was the one that was flitting about going to meetings. And it was like th this relationship had not ended. It was continuing on until you know, until they, you know, t the end of their lives. That she would be at home taking the calls, uh, getting the newspapers ready, um, and uh, making sure that he ate the right things and all this kind of stuff, and fussing over him. And I remember the first moment I met them was when uh, they picked me up at the airport, and he would be driving, she'd sit next to him, and every now and again she would pop a boiled sweet in his mouth. You know, like silently, without need, don't need to say anything. She would just be there, just give him some water, pop a bowl of sweet in his mouth. And I, I just remember that as a kind of an endearing moment. But also, that was those are the details that um, that allowed me to get to know their their world because it was a long time before I learned that my Japanese was good enough to really really understand what was going on. Right. So I guess in that case the. The best device to describe the, to, is to use a description rather than to interpret and leave to the to the reader to interpret what what you're describing. Okay. Thank you for that a fascinating discussion. Uh, and each of uh, you have uh, illuminated the sort of uh, and context of European writing in very differentiated and nuanced ways. Uh, so I had a couple of questions. Uh, well, maybe three, if I may. Yeah, I won't take too long. Firstly, uh, can one actually differentiate between exile being an exile? and be an expatriate. Uh, that is to say, uh, this is Darko Subin's distinction, uh, an exile has to leave and cannot go home, while the expatriate makes a choice. So there's a kind of differentiation which might sort of allow for again a bit of a nuance there with respect to this whole question of the extent of angst being undergone. So that's one query. Uh, the second question is, uh, is the European Union, uh, though of course the project seems to be somewhat imperiled at this moment, still a kind of uh, conceptual possibility which allows for a kind of transcendence of nationalism in ways that perhaps uh, hitherto have not been possible uh, at all. And for literary uh, sort of uh, practitioners in particular, uh, how has, to what extent has that sense of being European rather than being Portuguese or say being uh, uh, from Spain or even from Britain prior to Brexit, <laughs> well, that's still to be realized. To what extent has that sense of Europeanness permeated your writing? Um, well, you know, no, you're totally right. I mean, I, I was being brief, and I didn't want to go into um, those nuances. But it, of course, it's totally different whether you choose the place where you uh, you've been to, or whether you you are forced to stay in it. No? This said, even when you choose a place, I, I, it happened to me. No, I, I chose Rio, and I. I was interested in the place and I actually liked it sometimes. So what I mean is that even when you choose a place abroad, there's days or there's moments of weakness or, or solitude or sadness in which you... Elizabeth Bishop, one of the authors I mentioned, has this beautiful poem called Questions of Travel. No? And it's a series of questions she poses herself and every other traveler, every other person who has lived abroad has posed himself or herself at one point or another. It's, it's what fuck am, am I doing here? No, what, why on earth am I here? What is this? Where am I? Uh, and should I go back home? And more importantly, you know, where's, where's home by now? I mean, I, I, I lost track. No? I, I, lost, I don't know where home is anymore or what does home mean anymore. No? So that would be a, even the most willing and enthusiastic of, of expats I was in Delhi now with big members of the Spanish colony and some of them felt a bit in exile as well. No? Sometimes you feel like going somewhere and then when you go there, you don't actually don't feel like that. So, and, and now for the other thing, I still want to say, and we were having this in conversation yesterday, so all these subjects uh, uh, came up during dinner. I still want to say that most of the European voters still vote for pro-European uh, parties in Europe. No? 
uh, I mean, Marine Le Pen in France might get, um, let's say, uh, the most terrible prospects, 40% of the vote. Okay, that's a lot, that's a huge amount of voters, but still not the majority. So, uh, in my opinion, and it is the only political statement I would begin with, is just not to buy the, 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 the discourse and the narrative of the, of the, of the enemy, let's say. No? For, they can be noisy, they can make lots of, of, of hum drum about it, but they are still not a majority. So let's not behave as if they already were the majority. Bre Brexit voters were a very narrow uh, majority. And most importantly, uh, the, you know, polls showed that uh, the youngest uh, voters and people from big cities were not voting for Brexit. So let, let's keep that in mind. Not to begin with, let's not go into the into the uh, frame of mind of, 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 of the opponent. No? Okay. Uh, I think European Union is a, a wonderful idea for good times. Uh, for the last 70 years or so, Europe has enjoyed uh, um, an unprecedented time of peace and prosperity. Uh, European Union is uh, a product and the, it has also contributed for those, those times, but now the times are changing and I don't know if uh, Europe, European Union as a fiction uh, can be as strong as nations as a fiction because they're both fictions but as uh, nationalism is rooted in a true feeling of belonging to a place uh, I would say that European Union is more like a, a fictional fiction and people uh, uh, cannot relate to, this, to, to Europe the same way they relate to, to their nations I just want to say very, very quickly that despite being from Britain and being uh, from the country that has narrowly voted for Brexit, I am, I am European, you know, I see myself as European and I, I always will be. This question is for Bruno. It's about the character of a 60-year-old, unmarried, living with his parents. We are not sure whether he ever went to a cinema. I'm sure there is more that you know about him than what you wrote. Can you tell us more about him, please? Well, uh, there, there, I don't know that, that much. Um, uh, I, I just imagine. I just I, I can I can imagine how, how, how his life is. Uh, but uh, my, my grandmother used to, to have him uh, to, to fix uh, things in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a house. I think he lived off of that of making small uh, fixing things. Um, but, well, I don't know that much about it. <laughs> Actually, it's not so much a question as an observation. Um, I don't claim to have read uh, much European literature, but I have uh, been reading Elena Ferrante, for instance, the trilogy, and uh, I read Roberto Bolano, and I read excerpts from Bruno's book. I haven't had the pleasure of reading Javier's book. Uh, you talked about place, and I think that was so right. You know, place is very important. But there is, having said that bit about being rooted in your own place, there's also this thing that I could relate to Elena Ferrante's little suburb, you know, from Naples. I could relate to the characters that you, uh, um, you know, um, the excerpt that I read, you know, that, that lady who works and who's ill all the time and, you know, has to quit her job and stuff like that. You relate to it, you relate to Roberto Bolaño, though they are from different countries as Indians, uh, I think we relate a lot to the kind of cultural uh, uh, things that come out of that, even though the place is different. And it doesn't happen so much as uh, when we read American writing, for instance, or British writing, for instance. But it does happen when we read uh, books out of, say, Mexico, Spain, Portugal, you know, Italy. Well, thank, thank you very much for your comment. It's well taken. Thank you very much.